God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And this is God's kingdom, now and forever. The Lord be with you. And also with you. St. Paul says, You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Jesus Christ, 
who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. so that we may sell grain, and the Sabbath, so that we may offer wheat for sale. We will make the ephah small and the shekel great, and practice deceit with false balances, buying the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, and selling the sweepings of the wheat. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their deeds. Hear the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. In Psalm 113. Praise the Lord. O sing praises, you that are his servants. O praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be blessed from this time forward and forever. From the rising of the sun to its going down, let the name of the Lord be praised. And the Lord is exalted and of all nations. And his glory is to our parents. Who can be likened to the Lord our God in heaven or upon earth the earth? Who has his glory so high, yet condescends to look on the beauty? He raises the lowly from the dust and lifts the poor from out of the dung heap. He gives them the highest amount of riches, even among the riches of his people. He causes the barren woman to keep house and makes her a joyful mother of children. Praise the Lord. A reading from the first letter of Paul to Timothy, chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions and thanksgivings should be made for everyone, for kings and for all who are in high positions, so that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and dignity. This is right and is acceptable in the sight of God, our Saviour, who desires everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth, for there is one God. There is also one mediator between God and humankind. Jesus, Christ Jesus, himself human, who gave himself a ransom for all. This was attested at the right time. For this I was appointed and herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. I desire, then, that in every place the men should pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or argument. Also, that the women should dress themselves modestly and decently in suitable clothing, not with their hair braided, or with gold, pearl, or expensive clothes, but with God's works, as is proper for women who profess reverence for God. Hear the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
So he summoned him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management, because you cannot be my manager any longer. Then the manager said to himself, What shall I do? Now that my master is taking the position away from me, I'm not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to be. I have decided what to do, so that when I am dismissed as manager, people may welcome me into their homes. So, summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, How much do you owe my master? He answered, A hundred jugs of olive oil. He said to him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and make a check. <coughs> then he asked another, And how much do you owe? He replied, A hundred containers of wheat. He said to him, Take your bill and make it eighty. And his master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. The children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it is gone, they may welcome you <coughs> into the eternal home. Whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful also in much. And whoever is dishonest is in a very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. May my words be hope, spoken and heard in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Parables of Jesus are not cute little stories that are meant to make us all warm and fuzzy inside. Take today's parable, for example. Jesus holds up a steward or a manager, um, depending on the translation, who is unreliable and downright dishonest as an example. We might regard him as someone who is not to be emulated because of his dodgy behaviour. But then Jesus finishes by asking us some questions. If you cannot be entrusted with money, Will you be able to be, will you, can you be trusted with genuine riches, that which is of real value? If you can't be trusted with what belongs, which, what, what does not belong to you, who is going to give you what is your own? And the answer we would expect is no one. And yet that's how Jesus treats us. He entrusts us. Uh, a responsibility to his disciples, including us, in spite of the fact that we have shown that we are not responsible. <coughs> Excuse me. When we read about the disciples in the Gospels, especially Luke's Gospel, and uh, we discover that the disciples, and remember that the disciples were chosen by Jesus, were found to be just as unreliable and deceitful as the steward in today's parable. 
When the soldiers came to arrest Jesus, the disciples all, all ran off into the night. Peter denied ever knowing Jesus. And yet after he was raised from the dead, Jesus did not say, well, I'm never going to trust them again, the miserable lot. Instead of that, he went in search of them, just like the shepherd in last Sunday's parable, and forgave them and recommissioned them and charged them with preaching his gospel, his good news. Not many organisations would be likely to treat people that way. But God gives us a second chance, a new beginning. God doesn't treat people the way the world treats them. Think of another parable. The one where the man who owns a vineyard imply, uh, 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 hires some unemployed people around closing time and then pays them the same as he paid to those who were hired at the beginning of the day. Businesses don't operate that way, and for good reasons. Anyone who does that will be broke in no time. God runs his business not like the world. And it seems he will go to any lengths to help those who are in need. Last Sunday, the parables of the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son reminded us that God will go to any lengths to save that which was lost. Did you hear our reading from the first letter to Timothy this morning? Paul instructs Timothy about how things are to be done when the church gathers for worship. He starts off, first of all, First of all, this is number one priority. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions and thanksgiving be made for who? Those on the sick list? My family? No. Supplications, prayers and intercessions, thanksgiving be made for everyone. Then Paul gets more specific. For kings and all who are in high positions so that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and dignity. This is right and is acceptable in the sight of God our Father, uh, sorry, God our Saviour, who desires everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. You know, down through the years I've heard some preachers almost rejoice that people are going to hell. God wants everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And this is why the various prayer books published for use in our church have contained prayers for those who are in positions of authority, the royal family, the prime minister, and so on. But it's not so they will win the next election. It's not so they will be popular. God wants all to be saved. So when we pray for our rulers, even those who we might think are not much chop, we are praying according to the will of God. God desires one family, irrespective of colour, race, language, gender, socioeconomic status, and so on. Furthermore, Paul refers back to his appointment as an apostle, a messenger, a preacher and teacher, despite his having persecuted the church and thrown many believers in Christ into prison. Jesus met him on the road to Damascus, knocked him off his horse, literally. And sometimes God has, to, <clears throat> God has to resort to drastic measures to get someone's attention. If God is able to forgive someone like Paul, he can certainly forgive us as well. Paul says to Timothy, God has forgiven us and wants us all to be saved. But I have to accept God's forgiveness. This is why we have both a general confession and an absolution. Our acknowledge of our sinfulness is not complete without hearing and receiving the message and the assurance that we are indeed forgiven. That includes, as a matter of course, that I acknowledge I am a sinner. When we go to the doctor, we want to get better. We have to go, uh, we have to accept the doctor's diagnosis of our condition. Unless, of course, we go to a quack of some, time, some kind. We also heard the prophet Amos. He was one of the 8th century prophets. They're all bunched up at the end of the Old Testament. 
are sometimes called the minor prophets. Not because what they said was unimportant, but because they're much shorter than the prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah, who are called the major prophets. What do we learn from Amos? We learn that God is just. So God's judgment is always true and just. That means that when we are judged by God, we can be perfectly assured that we are in good hands. Amos had to take the risk of confronting the people about their sins and wrongdoings. If he didn't, he would have been delivering a false message. Even more serious than that, he would have been portraying a false view of God. God is also love. God is compassionate. So the aim of God's judgment isn't to make an example of us or to embarrass us or to humiliate us. Rather, it's to restore us, to give us a clean slate to begin again. There's something else. Today's parable is about survival. And survival can force us to do desperate things. A dishonest manager is caught squandering the property entrusted to him. He then proceeds to cut a series of deals with people who owe his boss money. Once these deals are made, the boss can't legitimately go back and negotiate payments from these debtors who in all honesty thought they were being given a break. The dishonest manager has succeeded in getting into the good books of the debtors who now see him as a friend who has their, has their best interests at heart. Once he loses his job, which seems inevitable, his new friends will take him in. Surprisingly, the boss, instead of being enraged with this scoundrel, commends him for the shrewd way he's handled the situation. Jesus holds up an embezzler as an example. It doesn't work like that normally in the world. Jesus' listeners would have been just as baffled as we are. The man shows no remorse. He doesn't commit suicide. He's too proud to be. He can't do manual labour because of his sciatica. Instead, he uses the only thing left to him, that is, the wealth the debtors owe to their employer. He makes deals that are not his to make. Each deal reduces the net worth, not of him, but of his employer. And yet in doing so, he secures his own future. And then the master says, brilliant. And most scandalous of all, Jesus holds him up as an example. What can we learn about living as a faithful disciple of Jesus, as citizens of God's kingdom from this parable? Jesus says, for the children of this age are more shrewd than the, uh, called the children of darkness, are more shrewd than the boss. Instead of being enraged with this scoundrel, commends him for the shrewd way he's handled the situation. Jesus holds up an embezzler as an example. It doesn't work like that normally in the world. Jesus' listeners would have been just as baffled as we are. The man shows no remorse. He doesn't commit suicide. He's too proud to be. He can't do manual labour because of his sciatica. Instead, he uses the only thing left to him, that is, the wealth the debtors owe to their employer. He makes deals that are not his to make. Each deal reduces the net worth, not of him, but of his employer. And yet in doing so, he secures his own future. And then the master says, brilliant. And most scandalous of all, Jesus holds him up as an example. What can we learn about living as a faithful disciple of Jesus, as citizens of God's kingdom from this parable? Jesus says, for the children of this age are more shrewd than the, uh, called the children of darkness, are more shrewd than
terribly sorry about this. I really hate preaching from these things, and I don't normally do it, but I have problems with my um, ink cartridges during the week, and so I've resorted to this. I hate them. <laughs> So, followers of Jesus, Christians, have a lot to learn from the secular world about things like commitment and doing whatever it takes. The children of light, as Jesus calls us, tend to play it safe. Now, what's wrong with that? Shouldn't we be cautious? Didn't we hear a few Sundays ago that Jesus uh, said that we warned us about uh, uh, paying the, counting the cost? before committing ourselves to him? If our Christian faith is always and only about playing it safe, never being adventurous or taking risks, we're missing a key aspect of what it means to follow Jesus. We're forgetting the total commitment Jesus asks of his followers. Dishonest persons, crooks, charlatans will do anything to survive to make a buck, to feather their nest. Certain things restrain us from being like that, like the law and decency and conscience, conscience and integrity, and that's how it should be. But the crooked are totally committed to surviving, and they will do it at the expense of those who have integrity. So Jesus is not telling us to go out and rob a bank or rip people off and then give the money to the church and think that they're securing their future in heaven. It's about total commitment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul and mind, and your neighbour as yourself. The Christian life begins in baptism and is a total commitment, surrendering to uncertainty, laying it all on the line, stepping out on a limb of faith. That will show in the way that we use our time, our money, and our resources and our abilities. Every time someone follows a call of God, there's an element of uncertainty. But that's life. If you leave one job for another, if you move house, if you commit yourself in marriage, if you make any number of commitments in life, you're going out on a limb. You're taking a risk. Following God to the limit can make you feel quite vulnerable and exposed. And that's the only way to living the most abundant and fulfilling and exciting life possible. The Lord be with you. <laughs> Who has spoken 
through prophets. We believe in one God and Catholic and the Church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the world. The responses from the prayers will be on the screen. Merciful God, your faithfulness to your people is everlasting, and you answer your people when they cry to you. Receive our prayers for your world and your church. God, our Creator, you entrust to our care the treasures of the earth. Help us to be wise and faithful stewards, that we may preserve its riches for future generations and share justly. With all people, the bounty you provide, we pray for those who enjoy too little of the earth's resources, for the hungry, the homeless and the refugee, for those who have no security, dignity or peace. Hear the cries of your people, our God, and in your mercy. Hear our prayers. God, our Redeemer, you entrust to our care the treasure of your gospel. Help us to be true and faithful stewards of your word, that we may be witnesses to your love and proclaim your good news in all the world. We pray for those who have not experienced your saving grace, for those who are held in the power of sin and guilt, for those who do, do not know of your forgiveness and love. Hear the cries of your pe poor people, O oh God, and in your mercy, receive our sacrifices. God, our companion, you entrust to our care the treasure of human relationships. Help us to be loyal and faithful to the families and friends you give to us that we may live in love for one another and together create a community of care. We pray for those who do not know the joy of companionship, for those who are alone or estranged from families and friends, for those who are unnoticed, unwanted, unloved. Hear the cries of your poor people, O oh God, and in your mercy, Hear our God our Comforter, you entrust to our care the treasure of your little ones. Help us to be compassionate and faithful in our care for those who suffer. And in our own times of weakness, help us to accept the care of others. We pray for those in need of consolation, comfort and hope. For those who live in fear, anxiety or despair. For the sad and the sorrowing, the sick and the dying. Hear the cries of your poor people, O God, and in your mercy, <coughs> receive our prayers. God, our beginning and our end, help us to serve you faithfully in all that you entrust us, trust to us, that when we come to the end of our earthly days, we may be found worthy to receive your heavenly treasure and enter into the joy of your eternal presence. We remember your good and faithful service of every age. For those who have kept the faith in times of persecution, those who have built up the community of faith in this place, with the saints on earth and the saints in glory, we raise our prayers to you. Hear the cries of your poor people, O God, in your mercy. Receive, receive our prayers. Almighty God, you have promised to hear our prayers. Grant that what we have asked you today, we may by your prayers receive. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Would you please stand for the greeting? Thank you.
We are the body of Christ. The peace of the Lord be always with you.
through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, whom you sent to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. Hear us, merciful Lord, through Christ, accept our sacrifice of praise, and by the power of your Word and Holy Spirit, sanctify this bread and wine, that we who share in this holy sacrament may be partakers of Christ's body and blood. Who, when his hour had come, on the night before he went up to the cross to make full atonement for the sins of the whole world, offering once for all his one sacrifice of himself, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. <coughs> in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Through Christ, receive this our duty and service, and grant that we who eat and drink these holy gifts may by your Holy Spirit be one body in Christ and serve you in unity and peace. In your grace and mercy, bring us to the joy of your eternal kingdom with all the company of the redeemed. May we praise you in union with them and give you glory through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, we worship you, Father Eternal, in songs of never-ending praise. Yeah. 
We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. We who are many are one body, for we all share in one bread.
bountiful God, at this table you graciously feed us with the bread of life and the cup of eternal salvation. May we who have reached out our hands to receive this sacrament be strengthened in your service. We who have sung your praises tell of your glory and truth in our lives. We who have seen the greatness of your love, seen you face to face in your kingdom, and come to worship you with all your saints forever. Most loving God, you send us into the world in love. You let us grace go thankfully and with courage in the power of your spirit. Thanks, Thanks. Thanks.